Walter, my 87 Carrera, had these annoying vibrations ever since I had removed suspensions and brakes during the big restoration two years ago. Tenaciously, persistently, the steering wheel and actually the entire car were shaking when breaking him down from above 100 to maybe 60. The chase of this problem took me two years. I had changed the discs in the first place, but used no-name aftermarket ones, so I had bought another set, this time from Arte. At the same time I had put the wheel carriers on the lath, as I thought I might have used too much force on them while pressing the new wheel bolts in. After that the situation had improved. The overall braking behavior had come closer to normal. But the more I used the car, the clearer it became that my countermeasures hadn't gone to the very root of the problem. You know, sometimes you just think that you know exactly what to do and you believe that solving this problem is just one little step away. One more afternoon to fix it and everything will be fine. That's when things normally go wrong. And they did. So I finally started to look into this with less hubris and more systematically with a gorge. The numbers you're reading are one hundredth of a millimeter, so the overall runout is almost four tenths of a millimeter, and that in my world is enough to shake the car to pieces. The limit Arte is telling us when we install their discs to a wheel carrier is six to nine hundredth at the outer end of the disc. What we have here is six times that. The question was now where is the problem? Is it the disc or is it the wheel carrier or both? I had no idea and as in the meantime it had become end of July, weather was beautiful and the girls were pretty. I decided that I don't care, I just wanted to get rid of my problem. I bought a new pair of discs and new wheel carriers. I bought these parts second hand in the bay. They came nicely media blasted, but the sellers didn't even remove the old wheel bearings. You know, it's not a big deal for me to remove them, but I mean, why would you leave old sandblasted bearings in? My confidence was shaken already and I put them on the lath as a matter of dystopia. I pressed the wheel bolts in again and this time made sure I wouldn't harm the wheel carriers again. The perfect support for this is an old rear brake disc of a 911. Next came the installation of new wheel bearings. My friends from Canada swear by Cerakote on all sorts of parts that originally are untreated. And who am I to doubt them? This part is very much inclined to become ugly in short periods of time, like this guy here. And so I thought why not giving it a try? I applied brake cleaner to the entire unit when the project was finished and as you can see it resisted all the tearing and beating pretty well, so I guess I'm going to use it more in the future.
Okay, we're all very interested in the outcome. From 36 down to 9. That's much closer to the tolerance limit, but yet it's not within the tolerance. This whole thing had now aroused my sense of ambition. I had arranged with my dealer I could return the Arte discs if they wouldn't solve my problem and got me another pair and after two sets that weren't to my satisfaction I switched the brand one more time. Dear viewers, this is not to make any assertion about manufacturers because we have to keep in mind that after the product leaves the production hall many people handle these discs on a lorry and off a lorry in a van and out thrown on the floor in front of my door, well-packed or less well-packed. There's one thing I can say. This one came from the brand Zimmermann and it arrived at my door packaged very prudently. The runout was now within one hundredth of a millimeter, which, I admit, is a bit insane. But I told you before that this is a maniac channel. At the right side, things were good as well. We started with six and in the process of optimizing it came down to four. We first tried combining certain positions of the wheel carrier with certain positions of the disc, hoping that their tolerances would annihilate each other, which they didn't. There's one position where the according screws can be loosened and tightened without taking the assembly off the shaft, if you have two helping hands. Eventually we very carefully took off some material from the wheel carrier with the file and managed to improve the right side to almost the level of the left one. I vented the brake system and took Walter for a spin. I didn't have any camera with me because I expected the problem to be solved and what would you film if you're intending to film no vibration? So let me show you the result with a metaphor. All the actions you've seen during the past minutes have one by one improved the situation, but they also unveiled that some source of excitation was still at work. If we think of the car as a vibrational system, the inertia and stiffness of its parts and components are responsible for a number of so-called eigenfrequencies, that is vibrations that the system is prone to use to absorb energy. These natural frequencies and forms are in the system response to excitations no matter where the excitation takes place. Or less nerdy, any vibration we feel in the steering wheel might very well have its source at the rear suspension. Measuring the right side showed nothing to worry about, but at the left side another massive four tenth of a millimeter were found. I took the disc off and noticed that the problem ran deeper. 
it was caused by the wheel carrier. Two years ago I had replaced Walter's original wheel carrier because it had shown evidence that the bearing had turned on the shaft. And the used part I bought on eBay must have slammed on the floor or something of the kind. Anyway, it's quite an effort to change this wheel carrier, so I wanted to first make sure that this time I really am on the right track. I bought shims with a thickness of one tenth of a millimeter and put them between wheel carrier and disc, put the car together and had a test ride. The problem didn't go away, as was not to be expected, but Walter clearly showed different behavior. Something had changed and I knew I was now looking for the problem at the right spot. The rear wheel bearing of the 911 mustn't be reused after separating it, so removing the wheel carrier also means replacing the bearing. I am aware that there are wheel bearing extractors that allow to change them while the suspension stays in, but the work is not a pleasant one with hands overhead for yonks and the permanent threat to bang my head, so I prefer to use my hydraulic press. The eBay wheel carrier went into my scrap metal box, and in such it should have been before it was dressed up and sold to me. My friends at JP just recently have released this part, and for Walter and all my coming projects, that's a huge relief.
We put the suspension together again and that is a good opportunity to mention that many nuts that are responsible to hold rubber bushings in place mustn't be tightened in the extended state but somewhere near the car's normal position. Some solid wood beam helps doing this. This guy for instance, otherwise there's going to be a significant torsional load on the bushing, which obviously has an adverse effect on its functionality and durability. Depending on the car's year of construction, between 300 and 460 newton meters are required to tighten this nut, which is responsible for the bearing preload. This is a hell of a lot torque. Some solid breakfast is recommended. Will Walter ever get rid of this and return to good manners? Not yet. But there's only three minutes of film left and the behavior had changed in a way that I knew I was looking at the right spot. The problem was right before my eyes, but yet not to see. In the meantime, runouts at the front axle were down to three to five hundredth of a millimeter and at the rear axle they were below nine. I took according measurements at all customer cars in my workshop that day. This guy, this guy and this one. And even this one, which is mine, and a coming main actor on the channel. They all were far beyond the values I had reached with Walter in the meantime. Four times, five times worse. One night, after I had repeated measurements for the 27th time, I spent the early autumn evening pondering about what is the matter with this corner of the car. And I had an idea. Now, a warped brake disc is a very common problem and the gauge didn't show any relevant warping anymore. But what if there is a deviation not in the shape of the disc, but its thickness? I never really heard about thickness faults being a problem because the discs are very stiff in this direction. But what if the warped wheel carrier had continuously beaten the disc against the brake pad till it had created a ditch in it? Once I got me a thickness gorge, the problem was just too evident. Six tenths of a millimeter. It's unbelievable. Night had fallen when finally I found time to install another new brake disc. Despite the late hour, I took Walter for a spin. And the problem, it was gone. A more extensive test ride was undertaken the other day. And unsurprisingly, not only the immediate problem was solved, but the fruits of months of intense optimization of the entire brake system could be harvested. Hmm? Not sure whether these iPhone shots allow to feel the quality and smoothness of Vita's brake performance, but I can tell you it's about as good as an original 911 can be.